For this next session, we have been talking a lot about serendipity over the past few days, uh, meeting people who perfectly suited the theme of this conference, uh, talking to one source and being led to the other perfect source in a phone call. But I think the ultimate example of that occurred yesterday when the Center for Workforce Inclusion held a summit. It was at the National Press Club, is that correct? Um, focusing on this exact issue, older workers, inclusion of older workers, what, what our society needs to do to ensure that older people have meaningful work, have access to the resources that they need, <coughs> excuse me, to contribute to society. So again, once I met Ruth Finkelstein on Zoom and she told me about this organization, it all came together beautifully in our next two speakers. We're going to start by hearing from Gary Officer. He is the president and CEO of the Center for Workforce Inclusion. But he's also someone who's had an absolutely fascinating work background that I'm going to insist that he start by sharing that with us. But then to also talk about the aims and the goals of the center and how we as journalists need to, to sort of tap into to what they're doing. So Gary, take it away. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I see a few colleagues to my left who have disappeared on their phones. And I'll try through my session to lighten things up, right? So I am the... Um, the CEO of the Center for Workforce Inclusion. I'm also the founder and president of CWI Labs, which happens to be a think tank that focuses on workforce inclusion for older Americans. And I also founded a network called the American Workforce Coalition. And our goal is to serve as a voice for low-income and marginalized Americans, older Americans, who are seeking to find their true place in the American workforce. So what's my background? Because my background will hopefully shed light on the story I'm about to tell. I don't have a presentation, right? So I want to just talk about my background. So born in London, England, Jamaican parents. I came to the US after graduate school and I moved to Chicago. And in Chicago, I was a real estate developer for a large nonprofit that was developing housing for the homeless. Then I was hired to go to Boston to run a public-private partnership that was financing affordable housing through a network of nonprofits. From Boston, I came to Washington, D.C., and I ran the National Credit Union Foundation. And from there, I went to Baltimore and I ran the Associated Black Chatters of America. Came back to DC and I ran Rebuilding Together. Went to the Wilson Center and ran their global engagement practice before coming over here. So a varied background. And at each point in my journey, I learned something about myself. and I developed new skills along the way which informed how I led in my next reinvention. Because I promised myself many years ago as an immigrant that I will sample as many careers as possible before I turn 40. Because by the age of 40, when the kids are now 9, 10, 11, you become a little bit nervous. Right? You want to be secure. But the lessons of life and leadership and personal growth accumulated in forms leadership. So we had a summit uh, yesterday, the Equity Summit. And the focus is really about how do we address the issue of race, gender, equity, and inclusion. And several of the speakers that came through my event came through today at this event. Hence my, uh, I, I wasn't quite comfortable to produce a presentation knowing that you've seen half the stuff already. 
But today I had a board meeting. The meeting ended at two o'clock, at one o'clock. At the end of the board meeting, my, my board president chair said to me, Gary, can you offer a closing statement, please? It's a two and a half hour board meeting. So I began to think about the last two weeks in England. I've been up half a night for the last 10 days watching this, this enormous outpouring of affection for Queen Elizabeth. I said to my colleagues, what I learned about her through this experience was decency, sincerity, and faith. And she embodied all those principles in ways that transcended her reign as a monarch. Two million people on the streets of London yesterday, they were not all monarchists. They appreciated what the Queen had done for their country and what she represented in the, her ideals about the best of, of what they refer to as being British. But think about this for a moment. She died on September the 6th. Uh, two days before that, she welcomed Boris Johnson to Balmoral and offered him a goodbye message as he had been forced out of office. And a few hours later, she brought in Liz Truss and welcomed her into Balmoral and anointed her and accepted her as the new prime minister. Then she died two days later, 96 years old. She worked up until the time of her death. And one of the legacies, I think, of her passing was her ability to stay sharp, her ability to keep up with current day issues, her ability to engage leaders on a frequent basis, and she didn't appear to be that diminished, but for her physical frailties. And so for me, one of her legacies is really about what it means to age, stay current, and remain relevant. She's a standard bearer for what aging and employment means. And I hope the British public will, will take note of that. So I ended my, my, my board meeting with that, with that statement. I also want to mention this. At our summit yesterday, I, I, I was preparing this weekend for Julia, who will follow me in her presentation. And I kept thinking back to the pandemic. So I'm a globalist. When I hear about retirements and, and, and medical stuff, I haven't got a clue after 30 years. I haven't a clue. I grew up in a country where that was accepted. You get sick, go to the hospital. You only go from A to B, take a bus or a train, you get there in 20 minutes, not, not 45 minutes to an hour. So, I, so I've, I've mentally switched off. I don't understand the logic of this country when it comes to retirement and healthcare as it relates to people who need those services the most. That's American exceptionalism at its worst. I don't understand it. Because in any other country, that's a right. Not a privilege, it's a right. So I'm, I sat there thinking about, about, while writing my notes, about the last two years. We were in lockdown for a good 13 months, right? Unhealthy, stuck in our homes, pondering our fate, not being able to go to weddings and funerals, Engage our families, travel, leisure. Couldn't do a thing. We stayed home. And many of us was, became very deep in our thoughts while watching all the news bulletins about what was happening in the workforce, what was happening in our society. And we also thought about what would we like our society to be once we get through this pandemic. And there are two incidents that really, for me, really stood out. 
when the pandemic broke, we had two epicenters that became very apparent. One was in Seattle at a nursing home. And the other was in New Rochelle, New York. And these were frontline, low-income workers, primarily minorities and older, working in nursing homes providing care. And between the nursing home patients and the folks providing services, we had this, this mushroom effect of, of, the, of the virus being metastasized and spreading across the community in the country. But we focused, if you remember, on the experiences of those people in those nursing homes and the workers who were exposing themselves. Then we began to talk about frontline workers, cashiers, bus drivers, people doing an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. And we noticed something there too, that the, the incidence of, 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 of them catching this virus was sky high based on the nature of their work. So now we're thinking about the future of work through the prism of the experiences of those we, we, we started to see uh, being affected by this virus. So compassion and empathy then informed how we thought, how we wanted the world to be after the pandemic. So during that first year, if you were older and African-American, you were three times likely to be unemployed, long-term unemployed, than the average white person and younger, three times. These folks have families, children, they're people of faith. And in some cities, these older African-American households were headed primarily by older African-American women. And in their homes, many of them were responsible for up to three generations of family members. So if you're in Detroit, if you're in Baltimore, if you're in Chicago, Philadelphia, in most African-American neighborhoods, what you found were single female head of households, 55, 60 and over. There's a story to be told about those people, about their work, about taking a bus from A to B, which in a car is 20 minutes, but by public transport in this country could be an hour and a half. So the relationship between access to transportation, to places of employment, was an issue in the traditional setting. So pre-pandemic, pre -pandemic, African American, older African American were three times likely to be long-term unemployed than the average white worker. We think that was gonna change. Let's assume now that we have gotten through the pandemic. The average long-term employment rate for an African American, older African American, is still three times like three times higher than it is for other groups. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. So I'll pivot to my British side again. The National Health Service became, came into being because of World War II. Brits were forced into the underground during German air raids. And dukes and duchesses were forced to sit and, and, and cower with ordinary people. And they realized that we have to be a different country with different values. So what you call socialized medicine and all that stuff came because people were forced together. They were forced to, to, to seek cover in the London underground for 18 months. So our experience of the pandemic was our moment in time. Our moment in time to do something different. To translate empathy into action. To think about people who have suffered, worked hard, but, but for. They just could not quite make it out. 
And when you look at the, the, the brewer, brewer of labor statistics occupational categories, this is important, by the way, in the 22 occupational categories according to BLS, the top 12, 12 occupational categories that requires a higher level of technological proficiency are overwhelmingly, over capital, overwhelmingly concentrated among younger and white employees. And that's, those categories are primed for long-term job growth. In the bottom 10 occupational categories, construction, retail, driving, African Americans are highly concentrated in the top, in the bottom 10 occupational categories where those jobs are likely to disappear. And that will have enormous social and economic consequences. That's real. Only five more minutes? Okay, I'm getting started. So, so, that's, so that's an issue. And then we look at ourselves in the context of our global com competitors. We rank bottom among the Asian economies when it comes to workforce investment. Bottom. Every one of those emerging Asian economies invests a much higher proportion of GDP into their workforce systems. We rank near last among the OECD nations for GDP expenditure on workforce investment. That's horrible. And then we have an aging workforce that by 2024, older Americans, 50 and over, will become the highest single segment of the American workforce. Their stories need to be told. The needs of their communities have to be ex examined. The consequences of inaction has to be told. And you guys as journalists speaking the truth to power have that rare ability to dig deep into these communities and tell the stories of folks who are marginalized, ignored, and are just seeking an opportunity, an opportunity to find their rightful place. And the rightful place isn't purely driven by AI, it's driven by culture. It's young people, I've seen this where I've worked in the past, young people hiring younger versions of themselves. I've been to places where I've worked where I've seen young people hire a young, another young person and on, on a Monday morning, they're all chit-chatting about what happened on Friday at the happy hour. And if you don't fit the profile, right? If you're not someone they can relate to as a peer, a generational peer, you're on the out. You have to be extraordinary. So the future of work and the future of, 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 of pre preparing our young, our older people for what's to come is gonna require investment, an understanding of their value, and a culture that recognizes the value of being older and what older people can do, can bring, and the value they can add to the workforce of the future. So that's it for me. My five minutes is up. Thank you very much. Gary, I think you can count on certainly journalists contacting you in the center for more insights and for resources. But while we hear Julia's yes. presentation, can you Feel free to, to have either sit here if you want. Sure, or, I can do that. Um, remember when we talked, I asked you to be thinking of some stories, literal, tangible story ideas. And so after Julia's presentation, I'm, I'm going to ask you to come up with at least one yes. just to get us started in the Q&A. Have, I have many stories to tell. Well, at least one would be fabulous. So okay. now we're going to hear from Julia Pollack. Julia is the chief economist for ZipRecruiter, but you're also going to be revealing the, the results of a survey. Was this survey done specifically for the summit? 
or oh, it's a monthly job, and it's about the intersection of, of race, gender, and Their, their jobs your confidence, but we, you know, it's a large enough sample sample that we can look at Excellent. different groups and differences across those groups. Why don't you come up and share that with us? Um, it was presented at the uh, summit, but Julia Pollock, everybody. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, very, very good to meet you. So I'm Julia Pollock. I'm the chief economist at ZipRecruiter, an online employment marketplace that actively connects job seekers and employers. And you know, I sit on this treasure trove of data, real-time interactions between businesses and employers. Uh, more than 3 million employers have come to us for their hiring needs, and we've received more than a billion applications through our site. So uh, you know, we watch those interactions closely, the wording that employers use in their job postings, the nature of those jobs, the quality of the jobs being offered, uh, and, and sort of volume of interactions and how they differ across the country and across different population groups. So today I'm going to just share a couple of uh, observations based on that data. All right, so if, when you get economists talking about this recession recovery, they usually get pretty giddy with excitement, right? This has been a very encouraging recovery on the whole. So compared to the Great Recession, you know, much steeper job losses, that red line is this COVID recession. You saw employment just totally fall off a cliff, but also a much swifter recovery. And what's particularly exciting to me is that the jobs that have come back have been better more flexible, uh, they've offered more benefits, they've offered greater schedule flexibility, more of them have been remote. And in our monthly surveys, we find that more than 60% of job seekers say they would prefer to find remote opportunities. Uh, that's huge, about 20% are only looking for remote work and about 40% say they'd prefer it because it saves them time and money, right? $5,000 a year in transportation costs and uh, 70 minutes a day in time saved commuting. And so many workers have been able to use this moment, this tight labor market in the aftermath of the pandemic to trade up, to move into better jobs. Oh, sorry. Uh, but of course, there's one group that has missed out and that is older workers. Here are some of the statistics from this recovery that are remarkable, that are very exciting. And these look like small numbers if you're not a labor economist, but if you live in the labor economics world, I mean, we get excited about three-tenths of a percent, right? This is a very sort of stable system typically where things move and improve very slowly. So a two whole percentage point increase is like, woohoo, you know, time to, time to take out some fireworks. So the employment rate for black men has risen since the start of the pandemic, uh, by two percentage points, a substantial increase. Um, and that's significant because African-American men are usually hardest hit by recessions. Workers with disabilities have seen their employment prospects improve. Teenagers have seen their employment outcomes improve. There's been a surge of teenage hiring. 2021 was the biggest teenage summer on record. And then 2022, right now, is even better. Right? Employers learned that teenage workers, without much training, without much experience, could actually be pretty darn good at their jobs and mature and show up on time. And so they doubled down this year and have hired even more. And then most remarkably, this week we learned that the child poverty rate, using that supplemental poverty measure that takes into account government transfers, was cut nearly in half. And this is, you know, exciting stuff. But if you look at older workers, it's a very different picture. They've somehow missed the boat on this one. So the labor force participation rate for older workers above age 65 has fallen by 2%, 2 2.5%, 2.4% support, sorry. Uh, the employment rate for black women has fallen substantially. And the poverty rate for older Americans has increased, right? Despite child tax credits and all the spending that has flown in the last few years, the poverty rate actually edged upwards in this age category. And you know, 
If everyone was just retiring and enjoying the fruits of their labor and kicking back and playing golf, that would be fine. But we know that's not the case. Uh, recession, sorry, retirement is a luxury that many workers cannot afford in this economy. And what's doubly interesting about this decline in outcomes among older workers is that it's not something that always happens in recessions. This time is different. It's very, very different. Older workers are sort of further behind in this recovery than they were in prior jobless recoveries. So why are they left behind? What is going on here? Well, one thing that's happened is that the jobs that have returned have come back in different places. Right? So here you see the change, the percent change in employment since February 2020, with some industries growing 50% and others falling uh, 50%. So there's been a big shift, a big reallocation in labor across industries. And there's a very clear relationship between the average age of workers in industries and employment growth in those industries, with the youngest industries leading the jobs recovery. Okay. So we've seen you know, the gig economy and um, warehousing and delivery driving and restaurants add a lot of workers, but the public sector is lagging behind big time with its relatively older workforce. Public schools are way behind. And in many of those, uh, agencies and departments and institutions, when they cut jobs at the start of the pandemic, they pushed workers into early retirement. And now many of those workers can't come back even if they want to, because there are all kinds of bureaucratic rules about how they can't come back part time because that would be double dipping on their government retirement benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So many of these workers have now just been kind of permanently excluded, you know, pushed out. And so one of the surveys I really enjoy looking at usually, and usually you know, the news in recent years has been getting better, uh, is the displaced worker report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And that report showed that reemployment rates for people who'd worked three years or more at their employer uh, for, for workers overall is above 60%, right? So people who were displaced uh, in the run-up to the pandemic uh, now, you know, a couple months later, most of them, the vast majority, two thirds, are reemployed. But that reemployment rate for older workers who were pushed out, who didn't re retire, but who lost their jobs because uh, they were laid off, say, uh, is only less than 30%. And that number is a 15 percentage point decline since the pre pandemic survey. Okay? So, Displaced older workers have had a harder time coming back to work this time than in the past. And obviously, I'm not just talking in sort of gross numeric terms. We know that many people suffered from COVID and, and you know, many people uh, were killed by that disease. But in percentage terms, among the living, there's been a dramatic decline in the uh, likelihood that someone displaced from their job involuntarily was able to come back. And why is this? I mean, the, the, the big reason is that these involuntarily displaced workers just face much steeper barriers to reentry, and the barriers may in some ways have actually become higher over time relative to what they were in the past. So one reason is age discrimination, of course, which shows up in study after study, and is particularly pronounced for older women and older women of color. The other reason is a pretty stark digital divide. So the bulk of job search has now moved online, and yet older workers largely have not. So the most recent sort of big Pew survey on, um, remote, on, on job search, online job search, found that about 83% of young workers had applied for a job online. Only 10% of workers over the age of 65 had searched for job information online, and only 7% had applied for a job online. Okay, so older workers, especially long-tenured older workers who hadn't done a job search in decades, they just you know, haven't had much experience of how it's done these days. Right? It's changed. And then in the wake of that, these huge numbers of displaced workers um, uh, facing this sort of foreign world, which is so different from what they knew when they last were looking for jobs, there's a profound crisis of confidence. 
So in our monthly job seeker confidence index surveys, the group with the lowest confidence by far is older workers and women particularly have very low confidence. And so older women are really the, the group uh, that it just is at a complete loss. You know, where do I look for jobs? How do I apply? And is there even a point? Will they even consider me? Uh, older workers need to submit more applications in order to get the same number of callbacks. They are far less likely to have received interviews. Um, and so many feel like this is kind of hopeless. And of course, the decision to make a, an investment in one's skills is a different one. You know, it depends on how many years of benefit you're going to get from that investment. And so if you're younger in your career, it may make sense to do a 12-week course. But if the number of working years you have left is much shorter, reskilling or upskilling may not be quite as attractive a proposition. Um, and so many people think they, they just don't have much option other than to accept this fate. So, you know, why are we worried about this? Well, it looks like it, you know, this, this could be a, we could be sort of steering towards a, uh, a, an iceberg. Um, we know that women are 80% more likely to live in poverty after the age of 65. We know that many senior women rely on social security for the majority of their income, for almost all of their income. We know that women receive less in, in social security benefits than men on average, you know, $13,000 some odd uh, versus more than 17,000. We know that women need to take that smaller amount of money and make it stretch longer because they live six years longer on average. So they're far more, out like, they're far more likely to outlive spouses and outlive savings and often sometimes even outlive their children. Uh, and then women need to stretch that smaller amount over more people because they're the predominant providers of informal care in their communities. And so this shock to labor force outcomes could come home to roost in the form of social problems and poverty and, uh, and great difficulty, uh, especially after some of these COVID relief uh, programs end and some of that money dries up, especially now with red hot inflation, right? So these families on fixed incomes, uh, especially lower income families that are renters, which are now both uh, absorbing the effect of uh, inflation and of rising interest rates, causing rents to go up, uh, are, are you know, in a precarious financial situation, right? Six million older Americans are in poverty, and about 15 million are uh, classified as financially insecure. And you know, it's sort of wealthier families that locked in those 2.5% interest rates that can sit back while the Fed raises interest rates and say, it's not affecting me, I'm not an adjustable rate mortgage, you know, no big deal. But renters are mm -hmm. feeling it daily. Right? So, so it's low-income families, it's renters, it's non-property owners uh, who are facing this double whammy from inflation and rising interest rates. So what do we need to do about it? I think the first thing as you know, journalists in this room to do is, uh, is create awareness. Right? There were so many headings during the pandemic about the she session, right? We know uh, that headlines, that stories matter. They activate philanthropy. They galvanize public and private sector um, action. And so the first step, I think, is to uh, unpack this problem, share the data, and, and raise the alarm bell. And then, of course, there are key stakeholders that have some ability to, to move the needle here. We have you know, key federal and state programs, uh, you know, job centers, and a CSEP program, for example. But a bigger problem calls for bigger and better solutions. And so this is the time to review their needs and priorities, uh, to fix what got broken during the pandemic. Right? A lot of these programs kind of got broken. The uh, community centers that they were using, the public libraries they were using were shuttered, were closed. Many programs just kind of stopped functioning. So now's the time to get them back on track, bigger and better than before. It's also a time, I think, for religious organizations, for community organizations to get involved and to do things like starting job clubs. Right? It's kind of like book clubs. You get people together, you 
teach them how to search for work, and their confidence is boosted by that, that sort of vicarious reinforcement of seeing peers get jobs, seeing what works, uh, having someone with whom to uh, practice job interviews, for example. Uh, there's, you know, there's nothing better for confidence than people coming together, forming a buddy system, and learning together from each other. Uh, my apologies about that. The community colleges was what I meant in that next heading. I will fix that. Uh, but community colleges are a major uh, site for upskilling and retraining programs for older workers. But now is the time to take the successful programs that are spotted around the country and to replicate them and expand them, right? And and see, you know, successful senior learning programs at community colleges involve a whole host of elements: outreach to seniors advising on which kinds of licenses and certifications to pursue, uh, support while people are studying, job placement uh, services for after they finish studying, uh, continuing education so they can recertify and maintain those jobs and constantly upskill in this uh, economy of rapid technological change, assistive technology to help workers uh, who are aging and who, you know, who are uh, dealing with impaired vision or hearing or mobility. And then, of course, the private sector, I think, should be encouraged to, to take a lot of steps, too. One is by joining the AARP Employer Pledge, uh, Pledge Program. Right? Another is by seeking certification from the Age Friendly Institute, by right? being listed there is a great way uh, to ensure that older workers can find you. It also means that you're, you're kind of taking an oath, right? You're, you're signing up, you're committing to follow best practices in hiring, to uh, um, considering applications from people of all ages equally. And then I think we also need to encourage private sector employers to have sort of best in class programs for older workers, older worker recruitment programs, older worker retraining programs that help people in sort of uh, shrinking industries and roles get the new skills that would help them move into the parts of the company that are growing and expanding. Job sharing programs that allow two older workers to split one job uh, and, and have part-time schedules. We know that many older workers do want to scale back. They do want to help their children raise their grandchildren. They do uh, want part-time flexible jobs. And so companies can help them achieve that. Especially in a tight labor market, there, there's an interest for companies in doing this, right? Many companies tell us that they are just starved for talent and don't know where to find candidates. Um, so coming up with programs like that, that allow people to stay rather than being forced out is a great way. Uh, job transfer programs, you know, geographically or, or even just within departments are also a great way. Uh, transfer programs you know, from jobs that involve more physical uh, difficulty and exertion to jobs that are sort of office jobs, for example, that are more comfortable. Uh, and then uh, you know, another, another way that companies can help workers is through phased retirement programs where they gradually taper off rather than having to go from 100 to zero. And lastly, this is a time to invest in public-private partnerships. So ZipRecruiter, you know, our CEO was recently at the White House meeting with, uh, with the Labor Secretary and uh, a number of other key uh, stakeholders there. Um, to deal with the public teacher shortage. And so we've created a dedicated job site for all you know, education jobs, for all public, especially public school jobs, uh, that is helping people find those jobs, bringing more candidates into the top of the funnel, um, and using the best in class technology that we know helps job seekers find their dream jobs and their preferred jobs. Uh, the problem with, with many uh, government programs and many government job boards is that they do not use best-in-class technology. And so if you search for a sales job on some sale, uh, government unemployment insurance websites, the top 10 jobs have nothing to do with sales, right? It's, it's actually, they're, they're quite primitive when private sector technology has just leapt ahead. Right? So uh, having those kinds of tools, the ability to just create a profile, 
get matched with the best employers, be pitched to employers who can then proactively reach out to you and invite you to apply and say, we want you um, uh, a, a job search uh, environment where you can apply on millions of jobs with just one click. You don't need to refill out your information 50,000 times. You know, all of those features now of the best in class job boards can hugely help older workers and God forbid we direct them to job boards that do not offer those services, which can be so helpful to them. So that's what I think we need to do. We need to get everyone on board and rally the troops. And I think it starts with the media and it starts with awareness. Thank you. So Gary, I've given you a bit of time now to uh, think about perhaps a story idea. And as I've mentioned to you, we like to send the journalists home with some really tangible, solid ways to think about reporting on this. So have you come up with a, an idea for us? I, I, I do. <laughs> yes, I, I have one of many. Um, and this is a person I actually know very well. And it came on the back of a board member of mine making a point at a meeting when she said that don't believe in this whole notion of the great resignation. My brother lives in Rhode Island. He was laid off and he cannot find a way back into the workforce. And there are so many people of a certain age who didn't resign, but didn't retire, they were laid off. And when a friend of mine called me, uh, she worked for a law firm in New York City in Times Square. She is 62 years old. Her company received a Big Cares Act PPP loan. I haven't got to pay it back. They let all the stuff either work from home or shut down for a few months. This is during a severe time. And then they began to stagger the return of folks back onto the payroll. And over a period of months, she's calling these people. When do I come back? She's calling, no response. When do I come back? She's calling and no response. And when that period ended, when the employer could then make a decision, they told her she's not coming back. And there are so many stories of older workers who were let go temporarily through the, the big shutdown, their employers receive these government-backed grants, basically, not loans, grants, forgivable. And when the time came for them to come back to work, there was no work to come back to. And that's a major story. You and must so, have been the person who told me about the, they call it the great shedding. I, I, I said the great shedding because yeah. we shedded out of the economy a lot of, a tremendous amount of older workers. And when you watch many of the media outlets, we talk about folks who made the decision to leave the workforce for reasons around childcare, to take care of an elder parent or elder relative. And that's, that, those are real stories affecting younger people. When it came to folks who were older, they, didn't, they, they were let go. And they had a hard time getting back in. I think the, the data bear that up, uh, and, and that needs to be a, a, you know, a more commonly told story. So you know, the, the JOLT survey, right, the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey, shows us how many separations there were each month, and it classifies them. And if you compare 2020 to the previous year, there were 93,000 more retirements. 93,000, that's nothing. It's like a drop in the bucket. There were 22 million more layoffs. And so I think the vast majority of older workers who say that they've retired due to the pandemic didn't actually voluntarily right. retire. They were laid off, That's and right. then there were these barriers to reentry that stopped them from coming back. Um, if you look even at older industries like public schools, you wouldn't have thought that public schools would have conducted so many layoffs. But the number one reason that they you know, lost 770,000 staff was because they hired 350,000 fewer in 2020. That's just these hiring freezes. 
they laid off 250,000 more than normal. And then retirements are like a handful, 100,000, and, um, uh, and resignations, you know, quits, about 200,000. But the key drivers of the gaps in many, many institutions and organizations were those layoffs and hiring freezes right at the start uh, that were just never yes. made up for. We yes. talked in the uh, previous session about personalizing these stories and whether or not journalists need to tell their own stories. And I have to say, hearing this uh, is giving me a bit of a chill because, as I told you, I was laid off in, in uh, May of 2020. And had things gone the other direction, who knows what my story would have been in terms of whether I would have been rehired in my industry. Uh, any questions? Uh, let's start with Monica, and then we'll go here. Hi, this is a question, uh, Monica from HuffPost. This is a question for Julia. I'm wondering why you think the teen labor participation rate has increased since 2020? Like. Do you think there might be age discrimination that's happening, like their employers are picking teens over older workers? So uh, I think there are two big reasons. The first is an incredibly tight labor market. Employers have reduced education and experience requirements, and they have expanded their recruiting efforts towards younger and younger workers. Um, you know, those workers, I think they believe, are relatively cheaper. So we, we did a business survey on uh, age discrimination in 2019, and employers expressed a huge deal of reluctance to uh, hire older workers for two main reasons. The number one concern was that older workers would lack the necessary physical strength to perform necessary jobs, right? More than half of jobs in the economy don't allow you to sit all day. They require you to be on your feet all day long. You know, hospitals, and restaurants, cashiers, and grocery stores, I mean, uh, the majority of jobs are, are involve hard physical labor, even in the modern US economy. Uh, and then the other concern is uh, tech savvy. Um, and then, of course, I think that uh, younger workers are just very um, uh, sensitive and responsive to the increases in wages that have happened at the bottom end of the, of the labor market. And so, uh, especially when schools became less pleasant and more remote and you know, required masking and whatnot, and colleges were disrupted, that whole college experience wasn't so fun in 2020, uh, younger people moved off into the labor force straight away. Um, you know, I think age discrimination is is a big issue. Uh, I think many employers don't even think of it as discrimination, right? They have, they post jobs for new graduates. They think of their role as training the new generation, and some of that is positive and important. Um, you know, one thing I think we need to do is uh, share stories of employers who have experienced, who've, who've take, made a shift and, and bet on older workers and who have hired older workers and had a positive experience doing so. Uh, so um, I'm not, I don't, I don't know if I am approved to share the story, so I won't share the employer's name, but one major sort of warehousing company uh, puts more stock, not, not Amazon, uh, <laughs> a personal storage company, uh, makes a bigger investment in uh, customer satisfaction than many of the others. Right? So they, they have more of a sort of, more customer support, a person at each warehouse. Uh, and there they have uh, dealt with their hiring problems in the labor shortage by, by hiring older workers. And they found that these older workers are the best people to manage sort of personal storage facilities. It's a relatively easy job. You are sitting most of the time at the desk. You know, it's not, it's not so physically taxing. Um, but you need people who are they're friendly, reliable, uh, respectful, professional, who uh, make sure you know, there's no misbehavior, that curfew is enforced, <laughs> that they don't turn into you know, crack facilities. You know, um, so, so older workers are fantastic in this role, and they have been a part of this company's success story. Those are the kinds of stories I'd love to see get out there. Julia, I think, I think we're talking about an employer-based response to the marketplace, right? Right. Because we, we I did about half a dozen national town hall meetings with older job seekers around the country. And I was blown away by, it wasn't just the, the enthusiasm and the desire, but by the credentials of these folks. Right. Uh, people in the, in the shutdown were online doing industry, 
recognized credentials for technology-based jobs. Some people got their PhDs, some got their MBAs, some got their BAs, some got their AAs, and these folks were current. But I think many employers are worried about that. So another major concern about older workers is that they will be overqualified and they'll want too much pay. And what our surveys show is that older workers actually uh, express lower likelihood of negotiating their offers, uh, a greater willingness to accept whatever offer they receive. Uh, they express greater urgency and sort of desperation to, to you know, financial <laughs> need um, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to accept whatever job comes their way. They're more likely to say they'll accept the first offer. So perhaps we also just need to show employers, you know, that may be a misconception. They may actually be young, but older people who are prepared to work for fairly little uh, despite their prior careers, despite their overqualifiedness for this role, um, because they, they want the the physical, uh, the, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They want, the, exactly, they want the social uh, interaction, they want the sort of activity, the excitement, um, the connection, etc. And to feel valued. And to feel valued, and to feel needed. And to feel needed. Exactly, exactly. Any other questions? Uh, Alexa. Hi, I'm Alexa with Fortune. Um, I You mentioned um, that one of the uh, kind of major barriers was the digital divide and thinking about how a lot of applications are solely online. Um, so I'm kind of wondering where do you go from there? Because I don't see that changing. I think most applications are always going to be online. And then we also, I think, heard in a previous um, talk about how, you know, older workers were still able to kind of merge with the times and, and go online with the pandemic. So I'm kind of curious then if there was a discrepancy with applying online and if that was sort of shutting out older workers, where do you go from there? Because I think applications are kind of always in that vein. Uh, I've seen a lot of that actually, um, particularly in the South, the lack of broadband coverage. So I was down in, in Selma a few years ago and I couldn't get a reception on my cell phone. Right, there's no broadband coverage in North in South Carolina. I was reading that the state had about a 25 percent broadband coverage for the state, and it becomes more acute in lower, primarily minority communities. So that's an issue: broadband access, the ability to get online, the ability to to apply for, the ability to conduct training on at home. That's a major issue. Now, there is legislation and appropriations that is seeking to address the issue of broadband access through one of uh, the big um, infrastructure bill that Clyburn and, and the White House put together. But the issue of access and how that access informs opportunity, that will not be addressed immediately. That's just one piece. The other piece I found is, gets back to the employer, let's assume, again, that we're able to create if you meet the, the, the minimum test and requirement for what's out there for a job and you still cannot get through a younger version of myself, because again, we hire people who we can we, we psychologically believe we can engage with on a social basis. I believe that to be true. I've seen it among my, my colleagues and I've worked, but it's, it's, it's a, the culture is the biggest impediment. Yes. We can take, yeah, one more question here. Gary, I wanted to ask you about the story you were talking about. Um, was that the Paycheck Protection Program? Yes. Okay, so um, there's a provision in there that that money has to go to uh, pay people, uh, you know, during the pandemic to salaries. So when was like the expiration date on that requirement, do you know? And um, yeah. is there any way to track beyond anecdotally, um, you know, employers, um, you know, laying people off after that expiration date? Candidly, I wouldn't know where to start. I would, yeah. I would imagine that the, 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 the termination date would, would, would be at the point where the PPP requirement is no longer active. Which do you, you don't happen to know when that was? I don't have an Okay, yeah. 
But I think the, the rules are pretty broad. I mean, they're more about how head count levels than about individuals, right? You can lay people off and bring on different people right. and still meet the requirement. I'm going to, to wrap this up by asking both of you to, to speak to something that we've talked about numerous times over the past few days, and that is the need to realize that there's not just one profile of the older worker. We're telling several stories when it comes to the challenges of the 50, 55 plus demographic. So could both of you offer the journalists some advice in terms of as they're looking into these stories, I know, again, there's no one person or one group of people that can characterize the challenge, but whose voices need to come to, to the top here? Who, who do we need to hear from to truly tell the story of the opportunity that's held within the older worker? Well, I think this is, I mean, this is a broader issue, right? There's no American <laughs> consumer. There's no American job seeker. Uh, there's... There is such variety across this country, especially if you're like me and you came from a different country. This country is like 50 countries in one country. Yes. It's so, so, so varied. Uh, and so I think that's, that's part of the challenge. Yes. Um, they're, they're telling those multi, those, that multitude of stories. Yeah, we're both foreigners, by the way. Um, <laughs> you haven't, can tell. Uh, to, to Judith's point, the older workforce demographic is not monolithic. Right? It, there's all these different factions and segments within this population. So we have, we found the program in Southern Illinois. I'm from Southern Illinois. We have, Where was it? We have a woman there who is a former finance minister from Liberia working for a nonprofit that we fund. I've got a former Harvard adjunct professor running my workforce program on Cape Cod. I've got PhDs, I have, I have a nurse from Cleveland, Ohio, who moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina. She injured herself from a job. She cannot stand for eight hours a day. She's looking for a job. She's got a master's degree. She's a BSN. She's on a federally supported workforce program because nobody would hire her. She's an RN. So these stories are real. And it's not, it's not the person you think about that is working two low-income jobs to make ends meet, caring, caring for their grandchildren. These are professionals. These are folks who have work for, were injuries that prevented them from continuing in their occupations that they were trained for. So I think digging behind the stories, because if there's one thing that's, that's guaranteed in this country, you can go from being very secure one minute to be in, in a very perilous position the next, all of in three months. And, and that's, a, that's a story we have to get out there. And on that note, I think- I just really had one more point to Oh, okay, go right ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, what I think is often really important is to celebrate the success stories and to disseminate those stories, to share them widely, and to encourage them to be replicated across the country. So there are all of these organizations, these businesses, that have applied for certification from you know, the AARP or the Age Friendly Institute. And those, many of those companies, we heard from some of them yesterday, like Greystone Bakery, yes. right, which are committed to inclusive hiring and which can connect you with the employees that they've hired who have thrived and excelled um, after a period of, of struggling through the sort of labor market desert, uh, finding employers who are not as committed to those goals. So that's, I think, the first step. It's, um, uh, you know, there have been lots of stories listing 10, 12, 15 companies that uh, hire people with uh, past uh, uh I mean, past offenders with, with criminal records, right? And what success they've had. I, I've seen huge uh, awareness campaigns about how well that can go. Um, now I think it's time for a similar campaign looking at companies that have hired older workers that have dealt with their labor shortages, their, uh, their understaffing problems, their enormous customer uh, service wait times by changing those jobs, making them more flexible, moving them to remote roles, and bringing older workers into what were once call center jobs, uh, you know, what were 
once uh, office jobs uh, and, and are now very, very attractive to older workers uh, and um, uh, you know, a demographic that has seen this, this decline in employment, the one demographic that, that isn't really on track to fully recover when all others have, and which offers huge potential to employers in this moment of sort of crisis, hiring crisis among employers. Well, Julia and Gary, I hope that you both will pledge to help us find these stories. I hope you Absolutely. will share the data with us. I hope you will send us the, the examples and the, and the stories of people that you work with in your organization, certainly yes. Gary, uh, to help us in this goal. The goal is to move the needle in how this demographic is covered. And we think you two would be extremely valuable resources. So let's take this opportunity to thank Gary Officer and Julia Pollack for speaking with us.